Thank, thank you so much, Leila. And it's just wonderful to have you here hosting this event and bringing together so many campaign groups, so many young people, so many organizations, all passionate about feeding children. And this is a really, really crucial issue. And as we saw today, Kantar says that food prices have gone up by 14%. That is unsustainable. So I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined by two of the panelists. One will be joining us later. And I start with Manura Wilson, who's the Member of Parliament for the Lib Dems for Twickenham. And James Bethel, who was Minister for Health in the Conservative government and is in the House of Lords. So we call him James. Come on, join us. I mean, we're all very passionate about this issue and very, very committed. Um, one of the things that I wanted us to examine today was actually how do we build this consensus and build it beyond, we know the Lib Dems have been very good here, they've already made a commitment, um, but build it beyond the Lib Dems, beyond um, the campaigners in this room to ensure that we actually get policy delivery. Um, Manura, you've been very much involved in this subject. Um, what do you feel of the sort of compelling arguments that actually will convince not necessarily your colleagues but other people within Parliament to actually make this case? Okay, well, thank you, Laura, and um, thank you to everyone involved in organising today. It's just amazing to see so many people and also so many prominent figures supporting this campaign. So you're doing a lot of that work already in consensus building. Um, I, I, yes, as you say, Laura, I've been really pushing this... Well, I mean, my party's been pushing this topic for years, and we were involved uh, with the Conservatives uh, in coalition in introducing universal... Uh, infant free school meals and we would like to go definitely further than that but in recent months I feel that it's been landing on deaf ears I'll be honest uh, until recently and so to see this momentum building um, and to see various prominent figures come out and speak in favor of it is, is, is really encouraging I mean I think for me to try and get more conservatives on side and I was very heartened to see Michael Gove's comments at Conservative Party conference which have been flashing up on the, the screens behind us during lunch and to hear Michael Gove say what I've been calling for and the Liberal Democrats have been calling for for some time now for all families on universal credit to receive a free school meal was really heartening. So I think to have a prominent conservative voice like that who is now back in government, I hope behind the scenes he and indeed James will be lobbying hard. I am encouraged by the new set of education ministers. I think there are some people in that department now who, uh, I'm sorry to make a slightly political point, but do actually care about children. I don't think that's been necessarily the case with some of the previous ministers, um, that they can be making the case behind the, po uh, uh, behind the scenes. But I think for, to get Conservatives on board, it's that economic impact, and Jamie Oliver talked about it in his video, the PwC work around the economic impact of making sure that children are well fed, that they can learn. I mean, I think cross-party, we would all agree that education is vitally important. We, everybody's talking about the growth of this country. How can we, uh, you know, turbocharge growth? You can't have growth without education and skills. And children are our future. They are going to grow and make, continue to make this country great. However, children don't learn in a vacuum. If they don't have a decent home, if they don't have food in their tummy, they can't learn. Um, and the fact is, if you're going to school hungry, as we know, you know, one in four uh, households with children are suffering from food insecurity, if, which means they're skipping meals. If, you can't, if you're hungry, you're going to struggle with your behavior, with your mental health, and you're going to struggle to learn. And so we need to put the environment in place for young people to learn. Thank you. And very, very comprehensive set of arguments that we need to use. Mm. James, you have been a real campaigner on this uh, within government and now in the, on the back benches in the House of Lords. I mean, where do you feel that the, the key arguments are? And having seen how government works from the inside, what do you think are the levers that we need to make and really push forward on? Thank you very much, Laura. And, and uh, I'd like to join Manira in, in thanking everyone for organising this very powerful event. 
Munira put it really well, I thought. Um, there are very strong moral and social arguments for this policy intervention. Jamie is absolutely the, the most articulate advocate for those that you could possibly imagine. But we live at a time when financial constraints are really tough. The government is making uh, decisions that no one would want any government to make about cutting the budget. So if you're going to ask for an extension of free school meals, it's going to cost £447 million in a climate like this. You have to be attuned to the financial climate that you're in. And that's why I think Manir is right, that it's the economic arguments that ultimately are the most important just at this moment. Now, I come from the health background, and I saw during the pandemic how unwell so much of our country is, in particularly around obesity, but also around uh, mental health and just a whole host uh, of comorbidities. We wouldn't have been hit nearly as hard by the pandemic if our country had been healthier when we went into it. And the financial and personal costs of the pandemic have been huge because we have been so unwell. Now, I am persuaded that free school meals are a really powerful intervention, a, a precise and surgical intervention that intervenes in a child's life just at the moment when they need it. It gives them uh, knowledge about what a good meal uh, looks like. And it removes a whole set of traumas that many children have uh, around hunger, uh, around food, and around where, uh, where uh, their food security is going to come from. Those traumas are at the heart of many of the food conditions, the obesity and the mental health, that people carry for the rest of their lives. And that costs us an enormous amount. So I see this as an investment today in stopping the flow of people into our stock of unwell people in the future. And that kind of financial logic is what I think uh, is the winning argument for this moment. That's not to say that there aren't strong social, political, and moral reasons for doing this, but I do think tailoring uh, our messages around that clear economic argument is what's important right now. Thank you, James, and welcome to Stephen Timms, who is um, chairman of the DWP Select Committee, Department of Work and Pensions, and also Labour MP for East Ham. We were looking about building consensus. This isn't meant to be a party political panel. It is about trying to harness those arguments. Um, sort of on a personal basis, I was surprised that Labour Party hasn't necessarily um, sort of come forward on this particular issue and is looking at um, free breakfasts. But really, this free school meal in the middle of the day. How do we think we can sort of really galvanise the Labour Party also to look at this issue again and actually see, I think, as James really articulately um, said, this is an investment in our future. And by letting them down, there is also the counterfactual when we end up with quite a serious problem. So, Stephen, what can we all learn from you about how we can uh, persuade the Labour Party? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I apologise that I'm so late. I've just come from a, a debate uh, in the Commons about benefit uprating, which Very important. Um, is certainly important uh, at this moment um, as well. But, I, I mean, I, I came in as uh, Munira was speaking and, and so was able to hear what James said, and I, I very much agree with the, the case that they've set out. Uh, my local authority is London Borough of Newham, which introduced... Uh, free school meals for all primary school children in 2010. Uh, a number of other London boroughs have followed since. And, and you can see the benefits over the 12 years that the policy has been in, in place, including uh, particularly on obesity, I think. The, the research is very interesting and, and clear about that. Um, and I very much agree that it's a policy that can really, it, 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 I think you said surgically targeted, and that's absolutely right. I mean, we're all worried about what's happening in poverty across the country at the moment. The impact on children is particularly worrying, and here is a policy which is explicitly only to benefit children. Um, and um, I, I think there's a very, very strong 
case, uh, and I, I know that my uh, party colleagues will very much agree with that. I mean, you're right, we've uh, announced a policy around breakfast, which I welcome as well. I think that, that'll be helpful. But I think we need to uh, move on and learn the lessons from the experience that we've had in, in, in Newham and elsewhere uh, as a result of free school meals. I just make one sort of rather technical point, which I think is also quite important. Universal credit was introduced to get rid of cliff edges in the benefit system. With school meals, we've introduced a massive cliff edge, that it, and it says that you know if your income is is it seven thousand four hundred and one pounds, you lose all your free school meals. If it's seven thousand four hundred, you can have them. I mean that's a ridiculous cliff edge, which means there's a massive disincentive to work, a massive disincentive to progress in work if you're on low income and you've got children who are. Uh, able to benefit from from free school meals, so I think the you know the reasons for this policy are very very compelling. Thank you. You make that very important point. Seven thousand four hundred pounds. I mean, I find it absolutely shocking. Yeah. Um, but on the basis of being shocked, it's. I think it has had this great thing, and we've got to watch out in in the budget for this. Is a fiscal drag because I think it was introduced in 2018 at seven thousand four hundred and has certainly not met with inflation. Yeah. Um, when we start to look at what we as campaigners can do to support you as parliamentarians, how do you think we should best act and how, what are the sort of activities that we should be doing to ensure that we get through? We've only got, I mean, obviously the, the budget that Jeremy Hunt is doing has probably already been written, but there we have had successes in the past uh, with Marcus Rashford, ensuring that those key messages got through. Mm -hmm. So what do you think of the tactics that we in this room can take away with us to ensure that we land this argument? Manura. Um, so I was talking to some young people at lunchtime about this, and I was saying you've got to get active, you've got to mobilise, talk to, contact your MPs, flood our inboxes. I'm sure my team won't thank me for saying that, and all yours, Stephen. Um, but you know, MPs really do take notice of what is coming in to their inboxes, and they will express that uh, in Parliament, and particularly for Conservative MPs to, you know, to to the more senior, uh, their more senior colleagues who are in government to say this is something that is agitating people and, and getting them upset. And that's why Marcus Rashford's campaign during the pandemic was so, so powerful because it brought it to the public consciousness. So it's fantastic that you've got so many celebs behind you with Jamie and Tom Kerridge, and I can see Dr. Zand here today as well. well my, hey. my eight-year-old daughter's a massive fan. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and if you can mobilize people like Marcus Rashford, because that really does seem to focus minds because that public uh, pressure is what is going to help uh, make Jeremy Hunt and Rishi Sunak make those incredibly important choices because we can make all of the intellectual arguments, yes. but it will be that public and media pressure, so we need you to mobilise. Uh, so that's a, a call out to all of us. Um, but James, it's interesting, isn't it? Michael Gove and actually uh, Robert Halfen, who's now in the Department of Education, have been very vocal on these issues. And they, as voices within government, how can we support those agendas that might get lost in, in the mix of the budget development and um, how that uh, is, is emerging? Well, I think there are, two, there are two ways in particular, which are sort of either ends of the scale. The, the honest truth is that many people senior in government, parliament, the media, including myself, have very little personal lived experience yeah. of poverty, of hunger, of the trauma of not knowing where your next meal comes from. Now, Stephen's constituency, which I have some historic links with, uh, the situation is completely different. But that is unusual in uh, the higher reaches of politics. And so the advocacy that has gone on in this room that brings those stories to politics, uh, and we were talking uh, earlier about free made me. 
you know, a really powerful campaign about people talking about their own personal experiences. It's just incredibly important for bringing personality uh, and veracity to the story. And I would just really encourage anyone who's in the movement in this room who can talk personally about this uh, to really go for it, frankly, because you need that kind of uh, emotional engagement to get something like this uh, over the line. 100%. The second thing, though, is at the other end of the scale is to go absolutely toe-to-toe -to -toe with the economists. We need uh, statisticians and uh, those involved in fiscal policy to make the policy case in very hard arithmetic terms that this is a strong investment with uh, proven payback. Winning the intellectual argument is just fundamentally essential to getting things through the Treasury. And we shouldn't shy away from that or be frustrated by um, uh, the, the, the delays in getting this. You've got to get stuck into the intellectual argument. And I see signs of that, but I think there's more to be done on that. I mean, you also suggested that we as campaigners actually um, identify or got MPs in particular to self-identify if they had been on free school meals it, and actually that we could really galvanise that group. Every successful campaign I've been involved with has got a core group of people for whom the cause is personal. And there's nothing to replace that kind of sense of conviction that comes from people who have lived through the experience themselves. And I think identifying and mobilizing those people, you know, there's everything that, that others can do to cheerlead and support, but um, you've got to know who your, your core campaigners are who are speaking from their own personal experiences. I mean, Stephen, your experience in Newham is very, very useful and important for us all. I also think that there's a very important argument, which is uh, the counterfactual. If, let's say, we don't do this, what actually are we storing up for those children, for those families, the communities, because there's quite a lot of concentration as well, but also for our economic future. And I would be really interested in your insights on what's happened in Newham and how you see those seismic changes due to this one, as you rightly say, James, very targeted intervention. Well, I think that is a powerful argument, and I, I, I don't know quite what the impact has been in economic terms over 12 years in having free school meals for all primary school children, but what I do know is today our youngsters at GCSE and at sixth form level are doing much, much better at school than was the case 15 or 20 years ago, and I suspect that this policy is one of the reasons for that. There are others as well, but I think that has made a, a contribution. Just a, a comment on what Marcus Rashford did. When um, the, the lockdown started, the pandemic began, there's a large group, very large group of families in my constituency who are hardworking, law-abiding, but they've got no recourse to public funds as a condition of their immigration status. Their jobs ended because of the lockdown, and they had absolutely nothing, no means of securing any support at all. They were able, thanks to a concession that the Department for Education made early on, to get free school meals, if given their income, in the cases I'm talking about, they had no income, so they were eligible on the income grants. Thanks to Marcus Rashford, the benefits of that extended through the school holidays. And so what he did for that particular group was provide a huge lifeline for all those families all the way through the pandemic. It was a very important achievement. And I agree with Munira that uh, emails into... MPs inboxes is a very powerful mechanism just for highlighting this issue in the, amongst the concerns of MPs and, and building up what hopefully will be an effective, successful campaign. And, uh, you know, we've got a Conservative government with a big majority. Getting to those Conservative MPs is critical. And I do think, and James will know more, there are MPs on those benches who are inclined, I think, to support the campaign for whatever reason. They may not necessarily have come out and publicly said it or are slightly hedging their bets. So if you or anybody you know is in a Conservative seat, particularly target them because I think, well, so you've certainly got my party on board. I think you have, to a certain extent, Stephen's party. Um, but not necessarily all the Conservatives. That's absolutely crucial. 
And I just um, want to reiterate the personal story point that James made. You know, as a, again, as MPs, we, we have the privilege of hearing those personal stories. Um, I, you know, I'm sure Stephen hears lots of them. I represent a relatively affluent constituency, but it does have pockets of deprivation. And, you know, it brought tears to my eyes to meet a mother at a surgery a few weeks ago who said she was not getting her prescription uh, medication that she needed to, to deal with her mental health challenges so that her daughter could get a meal at college. That's what she was having to forego. And this was a woman who had fed, fled a domestic uh, abuse, uh, an abusive partner. Um, you know, those are the sorts of stories that really focus politicians' minds and that we have to get out there to make the case, as well as the hard-headed economic case. Although I, I would say that quite often we find government sometimes making decisions that, you d that aren't necessarily economically <laughs> sound, but because it's the popular thing to do. So you have to do both. You've got to mobilize the masses to make it a popular issue, as well as make the economic case. We've got to make them listen. Our children need it. I mean, one of the reasons why we set up the Food Foundation was because I represented Margate and we had children who were hungry, going hungry right the way through the year. And nobody really totally believed me because this was impossible in the United Kingdom. Well, it's not. Um, we're going to wrap up, but I would really welcome just a last comment um, from you all about, in some ways, how do we meld this, this argument? There seems to be a theme around the human dimension, the personalization dimension, with the economic case, and that coming together into a sort of coherent uh, message that can be landed with maybe a bit of tweaks when it comes to different political parties and different departments. The Treasury is a different department from the Department of Education. Um, Stephen, I just wonder whether you just one last comment on what do you think, there is no silver bullet to this, but what do you think we can take away as um, a great sort of spur on? Well, it's one additional point, I suppose. Uh, I think partly because of the campaigning of the Food Foundation, the Family Resources Survey is now measuring food insecurity. And um, you can see in the first couple of years' figures that when the £20 a week increase was added to universal credit, the number of people on universal credit who suffered food insecurity drastically fell. I just think there is, there is going to be inevitably, with you know, over 2 million food parcels handed out by Trussell Trust food banks uh, last year, and the numbers are apparently still going up quite sharply, I think there is inevitably going to be a big focus on this question of food and food security. And this policy plays very directly into tackling that in a really effective way for children. Thank you. James. I think it's worth, uh, I mean, Stephen made a very good point there, um, but I think it's worth just remembering that, to an extent, history is on our side on this one. There is great focus on acute poverty as a um, public policy um, priority. Uh, the statistics on uh, poverty are becoming more and more clear about what, an, what a terrible condition we have in this country with uh, many of the same families churning in and out of poverty and the um, intergenerational handover that we have uh, between uh, uh, children and grown-ups on poverty, the impact of those who have disability or disability in their families on poverty. This is where policymakers are really thinking about proper solutions. And this intervention is a really powerful one that is directed at the people who need support the most. So don't think of food wholly in isolation, as though this was part of just a food agenda. It is part of a broader poverty agenda, and take heart from the fact that we will, as a society, figure this out. We just need a hell of a lot more pushing and shoving to make it happen. Thank you. Um, I mean, you've mobilised the celebs, I think, on the sort of heart side of it, on the head, on the economic side, I think trying to get... You know, people like the IFS and others to be out there also speaking out and making the economic case. Um, but as James says, I think we have to make this uh, not be seen as a welfare intervention. I think I think you need to make it an educational intervention and an economic intervention, and then that brings all of the threads together. 
This has been a fantastic panel. Thank you so much. If we can say a big thank you to some real... <laughs> <laughs>